In this video, we are going to put together some musical interaction for our game. That's right. As of right now, our song play class is really good at playing back some sounds, but we can't really do anything with it. It's handling all of the playback itself. Exactly. So at this point, we'd like to put together the necessary interactive functionality so that a user can hit notes as they go past the timeline. We're essentially going to make the game playable. Now we're going to do this by establishing a threshold around our song's cursor. And we'll say that if a note is within that threshold and the user happens to hit the note in time, then they'll successfully grab that note. Okay. Now in order to establish this hit range, we're going to need to set up a set of functionality inside of the song play class, as well as a configurable setting inside of our config XML file. Now you will notice that in between videos, Logan has cleaned up his workspace a little bit, and all he's got open right now is the song play class and the screen game class. Exactly. Just to keep things focused here, we're going to keep uh, a fewer set of classes open. Now what we need to do here is let's begin with the configurable threshold. So what I'll do is open up one more item. We'll jump here inside of our content project and at the bottom we have our config XML file. We'll load that file up and we will add a setting that will allow us to adjust the hit detection threshold. Now in order to make this hit detection easier to configure for an end user, we're going to describe the threshold in terms of the span of a single type of note. Okay. What we're going to do is we're going to say that we're allowed to set the hit range in terms of a quarter note, an eighth note, a sixteenth note, where the finer note value we have, the narrower our threshold would be, mm -hmm. meaning a quarter note would be a much wider span of time than a sixteenth note. So to punch in a quarter note, you would want the user to type in a four? Exactly. Four. Okay. We'll use one to represent a whole note, and then divisions of one. Um, I guess you could say at that point it'd be multiples. I see what you're saying. But um, as we go into higher numbers, that's actually addressing a finer and finer note. Now, conceptually, how is this range going to work? Is it, like, let's just say in the, in the case of an eighth note, are we looking an eighth note ahead and an eighth note behind? No, we're actually looking at an eighth note total. Okay. That really means we're looking half of an eighth note ahead and half of an eighth note behind. Okay, so a sixteenth up and a sixteenth back, technically. We're just basing everything off one single note, which is kind of centered up on the cursor. Exactly. So let's put the setting into place. We will call the setting hit range. So here in our config XML file, we'll make a new node called hit range. And we'll give it a single value attribute, which we'll set to a value of 8. So we'll begin with an eighth note span for our hit range. Then we can end off the node. Now in order to get this usable inside of the game, we need to go into our config class and set up a field to correlate to this value. So over here in our game, let's bring up the config class. And we'll scroll down to our settings right here below start full screen. So we'll duplicate this field and we'll call this field hit range. Now hit range is going to be or is going to need to be described as a number, so we'll change the type from boolean to integer. All right, now that we have a field that can be accessed by anyone looking at the config class, let's make sure we load up the value into that field. So down here inside of load options, I'll copy the line that is currently loading in actually not full screen, let's copy the line that is loading in screen res y. And we'll change the name here to hit range. So we'll be using parse int to read the value and the actual value we're looking for is under config options hit range. So that should get our new eighth note value loaded into hit range. Now it would be a good idea to check this before we progress on and make sure that we're getting the expected value inside of hit range. Mm -hmm. So I'll set a breakpoint on this line here in load options and run the game. So as soon as we build and bring the game up for play, we immediately break out to this line where we can see before loading hit range is zero and we hit F10 to step over the line, hit range is now eight. Nice. So I'll hit shift F5 and terminate this debug session so we know that we are getting our value out of the config file. All right, now that we have a hit range value in place, let's turn our attention to song play. And let's see what we need to do to put some hit checking and then our hit range itself into use. Now I'm going to begin by jumping in here just below our tick method, and we'll skeleton in two new methods. 
Well, really, one will be an override and one will be a new method. We're going to override the press note method that comes along with a song class. So in here we can override press note. We'll pull out our call to base.press note. And we're going to drop in a new method as well. We're going to make a excuse me, a private method called get note range. And this method is going to need to return an integer value. So we'll drop an int get note range. And get note range is going to take in an integer called note tick. And for now we're just going to return zero just to satisfy the return and allow our code to build. Okay. Now, here's the plan for these two methods. Press note is going to be used by the game class in order to tell the song that the user has just hit a note. Mm -hmm. And it's passing in that value simply as the track itself. So really it's a bit more, the uh, you could say the conversation back and forth between the methods is a bit more broad than a note. Really what's being said by invoking press note is that the user is hitting a track inside the game. Okay. For example, the snare drum represents an entire track. And so press note is simply indicating that the user has hit, for example, the snare track. It's like it's looking for that data attribute set up in our XML file. Exactly. So it's going to be up to our song play class to decide if that hit on the snare track actually hit a snare note, mm -hmm. or if it just landed in empty space. So we're going to need to make a decision based on where our notes are actually set. And that's where get note range will come in. Instead of looking at notes on an exact tick, which would make the game impossibly difficult, mm -hmm. we'll instead give ourselves a threshold. And it's going to be get note range's job to take that threshold into account and say that, all right, here was a tick at a specific value. Did that happen to be within range of the cursor? So basically we'll find a note, we'll feed that note into get note range to see if that note was within range of the cursor. Okay. So let's begin with press note. Now press note is going to need to look through all of the notes in the notes list and look at them one by one to see if they match the current track. And if they do match the current track, also see if they happen to match the cursor value. Because if you think about it, Whenever a hit comes in, we know what tick that hit is on mm -hmm. because we're going to use the cursor, the song's current position in time. Sure. That's why we only need to pass in track. So we combine track with the current song cursor, and that gives us a specific note value. Mm -hmm. So let's put together a for loop that will allow us to search through all of the notes in the notes list. So we'll drop in the for template, leaving the index variable i, and setting up our range to be this dot notes dot count and as we're looping through note by note we'll give ourselves a bit more of a convenient local variable we'll do the same thing we were doing in several of the other loops where we'll make a local variable called note and then we'll simply copy the value the rather copy the reference out of this dot notes sub i so giving ourselves the current note now we need to do a check and see if the note we're looking at happens to be on the track that was pressed. Mm -hmm. So I'll make an if statement and we'll say if note.track is equal to the track parameter. Now we need to do more than just look at the track itself because obviously hitting a note that isn't going to come up for five more minutes doesn't count. Right. So we need to see if there was a note within range on this track. So mm -hmm. if we've established that there is a note on the track we're looking for, for example, we're hitting the snare track and we've no noticed that, this, in this case, ah, there are snare notes. Now, are any of those notes in range? So we'll add on to this using an AND operator, and we'll say if the note in question happens to be in range. So we'll run get note range, and we'll pass in the note uh, the note's tick value. Now, if you remember, get note in range actually returns an integer value. Since we're going to use get note range to do more than just check for a yes or no value of mm -hmm. whether a note's in range, it's the checks performed will also give other useful information, such as is the note ahead of the hit range? Is it pending and not yet in range? 
or on the other hand, has it gone out of the hit range and has been skipped and therefore missed? Gotcha. We're going to be able to return all of these values from the same method, and so that's where we're, we are returning the integer value. More specifically, that value is going to be set to zero if the node is in range. It will be set to positive one if it is pending and not yet in range. Meaning it'll, if it's to the right of the range? If it's to the right of the visible cursor. Mm -hmm. And it'll be negative one if it's to the left of the visible cursor, meaning if it has just gone out of range and has been missed. Well, okay, yeah, technically to the left of the, the, the range box itself. Right. Okay. So that means when we're putting our check together, what we're actually looking for to see if the note is in range, we have to see if get note tick is equal to zero. Now one more check we'll put in place is to make sure that we can't hit the same note over and over again, since once we hit the note, we have to consider that note as having been consumed, mm -hmm. because we don't want the user to rack up a ton of points by hitting the same note over and over again. Sure. So we'll put in one more and operator, and we'll make sure that the current note is not hit. So we'll drop in not note dot hit. So we're not able to gain hits off of already hit notes. Okay. So we'll drop in our braces for the method body. Pull that back a little bit. So if we've met all of these conditions, if the note is on the appropriate track and the note is within range relative to the cursor and the note is not already hit, then we know that we can at this point hit that note. The first thing we need to do is to record that hit into the note itself. So we'll look at our note's hit value and flag that as true. And now that we've got the note properly marked, we'll turn around and trigger the note hit event for this song. Mm -hmm. So that way if someone listening to the song class, such as the game class, it'll be able to see that a note hit event has occurred and can do something appropriate, such as play the sound of that note. So we'll invoke the note hit event by calling our trigger note hit method. And then we need to pass in the note that was hit. And we've still got that stored in the note local variable. Now, once we have indicated that that specific note has been hit, we want to, at this point, stop checking for any more notes. Mm -hmm. The reason we want to do this is, depending on how closely placed notes are, it's possible that you could get two notes placed within your hit threshold. Sure. If there, I, I mean, I guess if it was an eighth note, that'd be really, really fast timing. Like or, a whole bunch of 16th notes. Or even a whole bunch of 32nd notes, if you're putting yeah. together kind of a, a, a... Like a drum roll kind of thing? Right. And you ran into a scenario where you had multiple 32nd notes inside of your 8th note hit range. Mm -hmm. If we don't break out of the loop, what will happen is a single hit could end up marking multiple notes as hit all in one go. Sure, whatever falls within the range. So we want to make sure that even if there are multiple notes in range... Only one of them can be hit at each given time, mm -hmm. which still means that if four notes are on range, you would still have to hit the drum four times in order to consume all four notes. Okay. So that means here, as soon as we trigger the note, we will return, or excuse me, um, looking at here, I think, yeah, we could return. So by returning, we'll not only break out of the loop, but that ends off the entire method call. Mm -hmm. Because at that, at that point, it means that press note can consume exactly one note and only one note in any given call. Mm -hmm. Because the moment we find the note, then we dump out entirely. Okay. Also, up here on the note.hit, I've used the quality test operator instead of assignment, so IntelliSense was kind of unhappy about that. So we'll pull that extra equals out of the way. Now, this takes care of the case that we did indeed find a note to hit. What happens if we exhaust all of the notes of the for loop and find nothing within range that matches tick or threshold parameters? Well, that should mean that we shouldn't have hit this track in the first place. Exactly. The user has pressed the wrong button. Exactly. They've, they've hit a track, but there was no note to hit. Now, we've established a name for that scenario, and we called that note mispress when we were putting together our events. Mm -hmm. So this is the point in time that we would need to trigger that event. So here, after our for loop, if we actually make it here in code, that means that the user has hit a track but missed all the notes on the track. So that means we'll call the trigger note mispress event. And then we'll need to pass in the track that was attempted. We've got that still in the track uh, parameter. So 
That should take care of both our hit event and our miss press, where we have an attempt, uh, an attempted hit that managed to miss all of the notes. Mm -hmm. So at this point, we need to turn our attention to get note range, since that is dependent is dependent on here inside of press note. So inside of get note range, we'll actually leave our return zero in place, and we'll use that in the case that we did indeed find a note. The way our checks are going to work is we'll establish the threshold, and we'll see if the note in question is out of range pending, or to the right of the cursor, or is out of the range having been missed, or to the left of the cursor. Mm -hmm. Now when we do this check, we're going to be looking at a specific note tick value, and we're going to be looking at in relation to the cursor value, which is, you could say, the current song tick. So that means everything inside of here is going to be done in terms of ticks. That means we need to take our config value hit range, which is given as a note, and convert that over to ticks before we use it as a check. So we'll make a variable here inside of get note range, and we'll call this variable hit range ticks. So we'll basically take our hit range and convert that to ticks. We'll say that hit range ticks is going to be equal to the number of ticks in the given note. So the note we're looking at here is config.hitrange. But we need to convert this into ticks. And we have a basis of how to convert notes to ticks because our song class has a quarter note value. Now in this case we're a song play, so we'll look at this dot quarter note and this dot quarter note is going to contain the number of ticks in a quarter note. Gotcha. But in the config file, we were saying like the number eight would be representative of an eighth note, uh, four would be representative of a quarter note. So we've got to convert that quarter note essentially to a whole note in order to make the div the division even. Right. So we need to take our quarter note and multiply it by four. And what that's doing, quarter note times four, that is giving us a whole note. Right. And a whole note divided by eight would give us eighth, eighth note. notes. Yeah. So then we'll take the result of quarter note times four, divide that by config dot hit range, and that will give us the number of ticks in hit range. So we'll store that in hit range ticks. Now we can put together a few checks to see if we were out of range in either direction. Let's first look and see if we were out of range to the left, or if we have missed the hit range. So we'll put together an if statement, and we'll say that if the current note tick so the note that we're passing in, if that tick value is less than, or visually to the left of, the song cursor. Now it's not the cursor itself we're looking at, but we're going to offset, because we need to give ourselves that range threshold. Mm -hmm. Now the range is the overall hit range. That means we get half of the hit range ahead of the cursor, and half of the hit range behind the cursor, and that will center the hit range on the cursor. Right, think of that value like a diameter and not a radius. Exactly. So that means we need to look for the note tick not just being past the cursor, but being all the way past the threshold. So if the note tick is less than this dot cursor minus hit range ticks divided by 2. So if that is the case, then that means we have dropped out of the hit range to the left, and we've missed the current note. So to indicate this, we will return the value negative 1. Now we can do the same thing, but this time checking for pending notes, or notes that are to the right outside of the threshold. So we'll put together another if statement, again looking at the note tick value, this time seeing if it is greater than the cursor. And then we need to give our offset to give ourselves the hit range, so we will add our hit range ticks divided by 2, thereby giving half the overall hit range in the positive direction relative to the cursor. If that's the case, we'll return the value positive 1. Now, if neither of these conditions were met, if we weren't out of range to the left and we weren't out of range to the right, mm -hmm. that means we're within the threshold. Right. So we'll return 0 to indicate that value. That's where we get our get note range res return checking against 0, and meaning that this statement uh, means that the note is within range. Mm -hmm. All right. With all of these put together, that should take care of our note hit detection. Now one more thing we'll do before we turn away from the song play class is let's put together 
the event call for when we miss notes. Since we now have the ability to tell whether a note has gone out of range and has been missed, mm -hmm. let's actually put that into play inside of our song play class. Now, in order to watch a note miss, a note miss will occur without any user interaction. A user doesn't have to do anything to let the note slide out of range and be missed. Right. So we can't rely on user input to check that. Instead, we'll use our tick method to watch the notes, and as they go out of range, we'll mark them. So here inside of tick, we're going to look inside of our notes loop. We already have a loop inside of tick, and that loop is checking to see if any notes have come up for play and then triggering the note play method. We'll drop in right below this trigger note play event call, and we'll put together a few more checks. What we'll do is we'll make a variable here, and we'll store whether or not the note was in range. So we'll actually make an integer called note range. We'll set that equal to get note range, and then we'll pass in the current note, and then we'll gather from that note the tick value. The reason we're storing this is we may need to use this note range variable more than once, and that simply saves some calls to the note range, the get note range method. Mm -hmm. We'll simply store the result, and then we can use it more easily. Now, the first thing we'll look for, as we're looping through notes inside of this loop, you'll notice that even if notes are far off to the right of the screen, we're going to loop all the way to the end of the song, right. because this loop continues to the very end, and that's it. One thing that we can do with our new note range value is tell whether or not a note is out of range. Mm -hmm. If that's the case, there's no reason to check any more notes. Sure, that's just a lot of extra checking. Because if a note is out of the, the hit range ahead of the cursor, it's definitely not going to be played. Mm -hmm. So we don't need to consider that note or any of the notes that come after it. So we can put together an if statement and say that if note range is equal to 1, then we can break out of the loop. So we're breaking out of our for loop here, and that way we don't have to worry about checking all of the notes that come after this note that is currently out of range. Mm -hmm. And let's see, we could even, to make this a little bit clearer, let's drop in some comments as well. We could say that um, note, or even better, we say his note ahead of the current hit range. Or even better, if note is ahead of the current hit range, then stop checking for more notes. Mm -hmm. so. Makes sense. All right. Now that we've put a little bit of optimization in place, now let's look at that note miss event and look at what we need to, to check for. Now the moment note range goes to negative one, that means we have missed the current note. Right, it's fallen to the left side of the range. So that's the note range we're looking for. So if note range is equal to negative one. Now we have to be careful about some conditions before we fire off note miss because the notes, the note range is going to stay negative one as long as the note is out of the out of range to the left. Mm -hmm. That means tick after tick, it's still going to be negative one. And we don't want to fire off note miss over and over again. We only want to fire it off once. So we need to do a check to see if the note is not already missed. Because when, once we mark it as missed, then we'll avoid any future calls. Okay. We also need to make sure that we don't call the note miss if the user has already successfully hit the note. Because even if they hit the note, the note doesn't go away. It just gets marked as hit. Mm -hmm. We don't want a, a note that is hit to trigger a miss event. That wouldn't make sense. So we'll do a check inside of our note range check. And we'll say that if the note is not currently hit, so if not note.hit and not note.missed, so if the note at this point is missed as indicated by the note range, but is not currently marked as hit or missed, then we need to fire off the event. And we also need to mark the note as having been missed at this point. So we can say note.missed equals true, and then we can trigger our note miss event. And feed it the note. So we'll feed in here the note within the loop. 
because now that we've marked the node as missed, next time around, next tick, we'll still run this check, and note range will still come up as negative 1, but at this point the note will be missed, and we'll dump out, so we won't end up calling either of these statements. Alright, with this in place, that should take care of the code inside of our, of our song play class. So let's build, just to make sure that there are no errors at this point, and now let's get some of our new events tied in inside of the game so we can test out some of our interaction. Alright, the very first thing to do inside of the screen game class is let's pass the input given here in input pressed along to the song so that it can do note hit detection because right now we're looking for the back button and let's add on to this if statement actually let's add a whole new if statement to see if the named input is currently note so looking at input data dot named input if that is equal to named inputs dot note then the user has hit a note and we'll change our if statement here for the back button to an else if so if we have a note we need to do something with the song if we have back we'll leave the current back button code in place now if we have hit a note we need to see what track that note was on and pass that along to song dot press note so let's begin with song we will call the press note method and we need to pass in a track that we're currently hitting and we'll gather that from input data dot data because if you remember way back in the config file we had this last field all the way off to the right for each of our binding lines and that was the data field in the case of notes we specify the track for that note in the data field mm -hmm. so over here in our input code input data dot data contains the track value which we pass on to song dot press note now before we jump in and play let's clean up some of our events down here inside of our note play we're currently playing the note just because the note goes past the cursor in this case especially in single player mode we want to make sure that notes only play when the user successfully hits them right so we'll comment out our call to sound engine dot play now where we do want to play notes is whenever the user successfully hits a note now in order to see when notes are hit here from the game we need to be looking at our songs note hit event so we'll scroll up to the reset method and we'll put in an event handler for song dot note hit so song note hit plus equals we'll tab to drop in a note handler tab again to drop in the method to handle the event and we get a method called song underscore note hit in the case of note hit we want to play the sound, so I'll just copy the line out of note play, drop it into note hit, and pull the comments back out. Okay. So we have the exact same play line where you're still taking in a note because this is a note hit event, and we will pass that track on to the play call. Mm -hmm. All right. Now that we have a handler in place, we should be ready to go ahead and try out the game. So as we're seeing notes fly by, I'll be using some of the key binds. Just to review the bindings that I'll be using, since we've got things like hi-hat notes and snare notes, we'll need to look for our X and our C key, because we have our top range here. If we look back up to our tracks, track 0 is going to be crash, track 1 is hi-hat, track two, track 2 is snare, so we'll have X and C for our hi-hat and snare, and our kick is the second to last, so the kick is going to be the M key. Okay. So the X, C, and M that we'll be using to hit the notes currently on the staff. So let's jump in and see how the game plays. So we'll jump into single player, enter again at select, and then we'll watch as our notes begin to slide across the screen. So here comes some notes. If I'm not hitting any notes, we're not seeing anything get hit. If I start hitting the hi-hat notes, well, I missed the, uh, the ones on the song. Let me jump back and jump in again. And at this point, we're not actually getting notes fired, which gives us the time to um, look at what's going on. I think at this point, we should be getting playback internally. It may just be an issue with the speakers on the recording station. Let me jump out of the game one last time, and we'll reinitialize it to make sure that everything takes. Actually, I think I just turned the speakers on, so give it one more try. So that means most of you listening are probably already hearing sounds. So let's jump in and test this. So waiting for notes... If I started in hi-hat, 
Now, naturally, I was missing some of the notes. Mm -hmm. Now, you notice one thing that makes it hard to get a feel for the game. That is the fact that even notes that are hit don't disappear. They gotcha. continue to draw um, indefinitely. And in order to adjust our drawing code, we need to take our note.hit and note.missed values into account. Now, if you're playing a note that is out of range, does it still actually play back a sound? It will not, because if our note's out of range, mm -hmm. note hit's never going to get called. Okay. And then we won't get any sound. So some of those misses that you were hearing meant that I was actually missing the snare as the notes were going by. Gotcha. So let's make this a little bit easier to get a feel for our gameplay. Down here inside of draw, when we're looking at our for loop, so we're going through note by note, before we get down here to the sprite patch draw column, let's make sure that the note is not already hit before we draw it. So right after note, let's do a check. We'll say if note.hit, then we'll continue to the next iteration of the loop. So we'll put in a continue statement, meaning we'll skip all of our positioning color and drawing code. So let's see what this looks like. If we jump in now, hit enter a few times, wait for some notes, then we should get... Cool. So, and it's funny as you can actually hear some of the inaccuracies as I was hitting the keys yeah. on the keyboard. I wasn't perfectly in time with the notes, and you were actually noticing that in the sound playback. And this is simply because we're playing the notes in time with the note hit events, so mm -hmm. when the user actually hit the note. So in this way, it almost acts as a kind of a practice tool right? because now you can actually hear how well you're doing as you're playing the song. Yeah, you can still get credit for a note even though if you want to get really technical, your timing was off. If you want to make the game harder, just lower your, your threshold there. Exactly. And eventually, you'd lower that threshold to a point where as long as you're hitting the notes, you should be pretty much dead on. Exactly. The eighth note, because if you think about it, we're giving ourselves an eighth note worth of range. Now, that's before and after, so that means we can be up to a, six, a whole sixteenth note off right. in any case, and the game will still count that as a hit and play the sound. Mm -hmm. Now, let's put in one last um, demonstration of our notes. Let's make it easy to see notes that have been missed. So we'll jump in here... I don't know, let's jump in right after color is defined. Now let's do a check and see if the current note happens to be missed. And if that's the case, let's set the note color to red. So note dot... Um, actually, the note itself doesn't have a color. What we'll do is we've got a color already defined in our local variable. Mm -hmm. Let's take that color variable and set that to color dot red. So now if a note happens to be missed, we'll just override the color we decided on mm -hmm. and draw the notes as red. So if we play and simply avoid hitting any notes and watch the notes scroll by, uh. you can see as soon as they pass out of the threshold, right about there, yeah. you can see all the notes turn red. So if you want to do something with the value or consider them in the rendering engine, it's very simple to just look at the note missed value. Gotcha. That's also indicating that our event should be linked up as well because note.missed and trigger note miss mm -hmm. happen at the same time. Yep. So that should take care of testing out the fact that note misses are being handled. So with that, really that covers what we need to look at here in this video, and that was establishing game playability. Mm -hmm. We now have musical interaction where a song can be told to calculate hits and can run threshold-based hit detection on those hits and then tell the game whether or not the note was successfully hit, whether it was missed, or whether it was mispressed. All right. Well, is there anything else you want to add to this video? Um, no, I think that wraps everything up. All right, then. So that'll take care of this video.